This is Transit Unplugged. I'm your host, Paul Comfort, and this is another episode of Transit Unplugged's News and Views, our every other week show, which gives you a real insight in what's happening in the industry by bringing you headline news from the transit industry you can only get here, and then a newsmaker interview with people who are working on items which are really um, breaking right now, uh, news breaking in the industry of transit, and then a look at what's happening in the future. And today is no exception. We've got a great interview with Tyler Dvorak and Terry Bills of Trapeze and Esri, who are gonna be talking about uh, what agencies can do with GIS and related data sets, and why aren't they doing it? An interview conducted by our producer, Trish Hussey. I think you'll really enjoy that right after this headline news episode. Uh, big headline news this week, actually, is that passengers will now be required here in the United States to continue to wear masks on the nation's trains, buses, and airplanes, and in airports now through January 18th under a federal mandate extended this past week by the Biden administration. The mask mandate by the Transportation Security Administration had been set to expire on September 13th, uh, but now they've extended it uh, due to the surge in coronavirus cases and some of uh, the variants. So big news is uh, for another, you know, through for the rest of the year and into January, at least now, the federal mandate is that you'll have to continue to wear these masks. Transit, though, is continuing to remain resilient. One of the uh, big news items coming from across the um, across the pond in London is that tests have found no traces of COVID-19 in swabs and air samples of four major railway stations and inner city transit services, according to Network Rail in London. Two lots of testing took place at London's Euston, Birmingham, New Street, Liverpool, Lime Street, and Manchester Piccadilly Station. Heavily touched areas such as escalator handles were swabbed while hour-long air samples were checked for airborne virus. The tests were repeated on trains running between the stations. And according to news reports from the BBC, there has been extra cleaning of transport services throughout the pandemic to protect against the virus spreading through the contaminated services and the air. And the Imperial College of London researchers examined the results of the tests, which took place in January and June, and get this, found no coronavirus contamination of any surface or airborne virus particles. And that's from the BBC News. So very interesting. Transit is continuing to move forward. Our good friends, uh, MJ Maynard, the CEO of the Regional Transportation Commission of Southern Nevada in Las Vegas in that region, has expanded, has announced expanded and improved transit service throughout the valley, thanks to the federal stimulus funding. The service is aimed to help Southern Nevadans reconnect to destinations, resources, and opportunities. As RTC's largest transit service area expansion in recent history, it includes two new routes, several extended routes, and introduction of RTC on demand, a pilot microtransit service. And uh, MJ Maynard says these changes will increase access, efficiency, equity, and introduce innovative tactics never before used in the RTC system. The agency recently hosted seven community events to generate public awareness and provide information about the new services. And um, the mayor has said that as the public transportation provider for Southern Nevada, RTC has always recognized the essential nature of the services it provides the service changes have enhanced transit access and efficiency while promoting innovation. And uh, the transit service changes will also improve access for paratransit customers, connect more people to employment opportunities, connect to resort corridor employees who previously did not have access to transit. And they now have additional connections to childcare facilities and schools and grocery stores. And as I mentioned, the service enhancements also include the introduction of RTC On Demand, a pilot microtransit service in the Southwest and West Henderson, the implementation of a transit lab initiative to provide faster and more frequent service to some of the busiest stops. Uh, and within the urban core, the expansion of service also includes the restoration of weekend service in underserved areas, plus many new routes. Congratulations to the RTC in Las Vegas for showing that even in the wake of this, of this um, you know, new COVID wave with the Delta variant, et cetera, the transit can, can continue to grow and expand. A couple other pieces of news from the business side, Optimus Ride and Partners has been awarded a Department of Energy grant for large AV fleet and research. Optimus Ride uh, is a um, uh, an AV company, an autonomous vehicle company, and they have partnered with Clemson University, the University of California, Berkeley, and Argonne National Laboratory to provide modern practical mobility services for students, faculty, staff, and visitors at Clemson University and conduct cutting edge research on the interplay of sustainability, 
rider behavior, and autonomous vehicles. The Department of Energy grant of up to $4.3 million will allow for one of the largest deployments of autonomous vehicles in the U.S. over a three-year period. In support of the Biden-Harris administration's goal of net zero emissions economy by 2050, this deployment is part of the Department of Energy's $60 million effort to fund 24 research and development projects that are decarbonizing the transportation sector and reducing CO2 emissions from passenger cars and light and heavy duty trucks. Optimus Ride is the sole AV company selected by the Department of Energy to unite national energy initiatives, academic research, and measured advancement of AV technology. And finally, one other bit of news uh, from Proterra, the leading uh, electric bus manufacturer, they have concluded negotiations with LG Energy Solutions on a new agreement that will provide Proterra with a long-term supply of cylindrical cells produced at an LG Energy Solution battery cell manufacturing plant, get this, in the U.S. The U.S. manufactured battery cells will be delivered to Proterra factors, factories for the manufacture of their electric vehicle battery systems. So um, that's good. There's been a lot of concern about uh you know, rare earth metals, et cetera, and the supply of them. And this is a U.S.-based factory providing batteries to this um, manufacturer of buses here in the U.S. Well, that's, a, that's it for our look around the world at news affecting public transportation. One final tidbit we want to pass, we'd like to pass on to you um, information about leaders in the industry. Valley Metro CEO Scott Smith recently informed the board of directors of his intent to retire after serving as the agency's chief executive for the past five and a half years. Uh, he will not seek to extend his current contract, which expires at the end of this fiscal year there in the Phoenix area. Congratulations to Scott Smith for a great run there. Uh, and um, they have already started their recruitment process nationwide for Smith's successor. Thanks for being with us today on Transit Unplugged News and Views. Now stay tuned for our Newsmaker interview here on the leading industry podcast, Transit Unplugged. I'm Alea Carey, a communications consultant who loves working with public transit agencies. Happy August, everybody, and happy back-to-school season in another year of pandemic concerns. There's a big push to get kids back in the classroom this year, but still much anxiety around the risks of doing that and how it will be accomplished. What do transit organizations need to consider when promoting school time services? The first step is to remind parents and students that getting to school on transit is possible. As we've all experienced for the last 500 days or so, a lot of people who used to be regular riders got used to working and studying at home or to traveling by their own vehicles. To counteract that, we need basic, consistent, and much-repeated messaging about transit's utility for the school commute. The next level is to inform the public on which routes provide services to which schools. Consider working with communications partners like the school board and individual campuses to get these messages across. The third piece to this communications puzzle is to remind the public that transit is safe. That includes telling them about your particular safety protocols like cleaning and distancing, in addition to reminding them about mask mandates. Finally, make sure everyone knows that students ride on special discounts or maybe on no fares at all. If you'd like to talk more about back-to-school communications challenges or anything else related to communications and public transit, look me up on LinkedIn. My first name is spelled E-L-E-A, last name C-A-R-E-Y. Hey, this is Tris Hussey, and welcome to another edition of Transit Tech. And I'm here joined with two luminaries in the data and GIS world, Tyler Dvorak, who is the director, the product director of mobility planning and scheduling here at Trapeze, and Terry Bills, who is the global transportation industry manager at Esri. So fant- fantastic. Thank you both for joining, joining me today. And we're going to talk about data, GIS data specifically in transit agencies. So I only have two questions for us today. The first one is going to be, well, what can agencies do with geographic data to help them in their in their world and in their lives? What is, you know, what's great about it? And then the next question after you go that is like, well, why aren't more people doing it? So let's start the first one. What can transit agencies do with geographic and other, you know, the data essentially that it would come from Esri? Right. So, uh, yeah, great question. And when I talk to 
planners, to IT people, to CIOs, to transit agencies, uh, the big issue that they really struggle with is, is with data. And I think we all understand that it is data that really is going to make transit agencies more effective, better at designing more effective routes, monitoring their own performance, and, and really it, it is information. It's data and information that's the centerpiece of, of really improving your performance at a transit agency. So really starting on the, on the planning side, the ability, uh, we at Esri spend a great deal of time literally curating data uh, not just census data, obviously we have that, but really very, very detailed data, consumer behavior, uh, a whole range of data sources that really allow a transportation planner to really understand the mobility patterns of people within the city and, and really how they can leverage that data to really design more effective and more productive routes. And, and you know, so that's from that to really how do you use all of the data within your own organization to really feed that back and how do you monitor your performance so that really the most successful transit agencies that I know are ones that are really you know strongly dedicated to how do I continuously improve my performance? How do I continuously improve customer satisfaction? And all of that really depends on data and information. And ultimately, all of that is spatial. So that's the sort of the way that we see the world. And I think that it's, it's um, the ability to leverage all of that data is really what I think is going to make transit agencies more effective and more productive. I 100% agree with that. And ultimately, when I think about data, I think of how to make it complementary and find the connections between it. So for example, like Terry mentioned, um, almost all data is spatial and even transit data, I, I would argue all of it could be or can be traced back to a spatial component. Um, Cause basically we're saying in transit scheduling is where is a vehicle and driver going to be at a given time? Um, and where they're going to be is a place in space. And so ensuring that the data that we have uh, it's complementary is super important to ensuring that we can make smart decisions and understand the impacts of those decisions. There's very different data we're talking about using when it comes to making those decisions. We have the spatial data, we have the operational data, um, and then we have the the other part of the operational data, which is built on top of the first of operational data. So we can have these kind of di very different uh, data sets, but they all can be connected. It's hard, but it can be done. And when it is done, it's incredibly powerful because it not only helps you decide what you can do, but what you should do, because you're always balancing trade-offs as a planner and scheduler. You're always operating in a world of limited resources and ensuring that you're being as effective as you can. Meeting your goals um, is a huge challenge and requires a lot of data to do. So therefore, making sure they're complementary, connected, and uh, correlated is frankly critical. I, the, the thing that reminds me of, both of what both of you are saying, uh, uh, the last episode of Transit Tech, I was talking to Farouk Mansouri, who's a lead data scientist at Trapeze, and he was talking about the more data you can put together, the, the richer the story is and the more pieces i think um uh, when i've looked at uh, as tyler and i've been working on an ebook uh on for mps and the future of mps with with esri data like one of the 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 charts that continually blows my mind is that chart where it shows how far can you go in a given set of time from a from a given place and to me that is one of the most fascinating parts of data for inclusiveness and equality in a transit system you go like wow people from this part of the part of the city really can't get very far very fast why and i think that that's just a powerful thing yep. yeah i ultimately I, I think that's one of the central issues that just about every transit agency is grappling with is is really how do we provide an equitable service and, and equitable accessibility? And that's accessibility to jobs, to schools, to shopping, to healthcare, to 
to a wide range. And we actually have the tools to do that in a way that we can really look at those accessibility issues and we can really begin to really understand how we can create and, and design much, much more equitable systems. And I think that's really one of the central challenges that we have as we look ahead and, and as we look at transit agencies coming out of this really very difficult period over the last year, how do we rethink our service in a certain way and, and how do we look at really providing better more efficient and more equitable service. And all of that is fundamentally going to depend on having good data. And I think that's really the, the you, know, you know, what we're really trying to do is to unlock all of that information and put it at the disposal of, of transit agencies in a way that they really can, in a certain sense, reinvent their service to be much more productive much more equitable and and uh, providing better transportation for, for for all within our urban environments. So I don't want to lose sight of the tools as well, right? Bringing the data together uh, is key, but then being able to capitalize on that with leading tools that Esri has uh, that make getting these insights quick and easy. I mean, that's one of the biggest things I, I would want to focus on is that ultimately all this data already exists. All these tools already exist. But no, you asked, I think your second question is, why aren't people doing this? And not to get put get too far ahead, but ultimately it's because it's hard to do all this. Mm -hmm. It's hard to get the data all in one place. It's hard to stage it out. It's, right, it's not just about tools for tools' sakes, but it's about decision-making tools, allowing planners and schedulers to stand with confidence in front of the public, in front of their boards, and say, hey, here's what we think we should do. And it's not my idea as a planner that I just came up with this. It's what the data is telling us we should do. Here's why I'm suggesting or presenting this material. Um, here's how we can not just make more transit more equitable, but we can make it more usable, more reliable for customers. We talked about that network analyst uh, tool with the, the cool map showing uh, how far we can get. We can take that a step further and show how stable those zones are. And so if I'm one minute late and I miss my bus and that bus comes every 30 minutes, those zones could shrink substantially down to basically nothing. Or if the bus comes every five or 10 minutes, all of a sudden those zones are much more stable. And now I'm much more willing to use transit uh, instead of a personal car because it actually does provide the same level of freedom of movement that a personal car does. Um, and then, so being able to visualize that, right? It's a very uh, interesting and impactful thing, you know, in theory, but being able to visualize that and then share that again with a broader audience is a whole nother. Right. And, and, you know, really to, again, to your second question, I, I think historically it was fairly difficult. I mean, as I would talk to CIOs and IT directors, their central challenge was we, we have all this information in our organizations, but we just don't have the ability to really integrate it and, and use it effectively. And, and I think that's, that has fundamentally changed. And, and, even we at Esri have recognized that while we have, you know, really tremendous technology that gets us to other planets and all of that, the real challenge for us is how do we make it simple and usable by our, our customers? And I think that's what, that's the challenge. So how do we put all of this power really in the hands of, of, of a non-GIS trained person? We, we want the regular planner within the agency to be able to have this powerful analytical capabilities, but not they don't want to spend a lot of time learning GIS. That's that's just and, and so what what we the challenge ahead of us and, and you know one that I think we're we're successfully doing is is how do we make it simple and how do we bring all that power to use in a very straightforward, easy to use way that really delivers huge insights at really sort of low barriers. We make it uh, easy to use. It's just, it, it's a winning combination. I, I think we've all come to realize that we need to make these very powerful tools easy to use uh, in ways that, you know, really it's not just experts that can leverage the power, but we really need to put it into the 
into the hands of the planners and, and for that matter, even into, you know, really so that decision makers can see and can ask the questions in real time and, and can get the answers that they need so they can ultimately make better decisions. And I think that's there's really been a huge transformation you know, really across all technologies. And I think, you know, the, the smartphone is the greatest example. We all just pick up a smartphone and we know how to use it and we know how to use the applications on our smartphone. That's really kind of our our challenge is that how do we how do we design to that level of simplicity? And and I think that's really kind of how do we put that kind of power into that ease of use. Yeah, no, I 100% agree with that goal. It's it's very interesting when you get a little deeper into what that user experience really kind of means. It, it turns into emotional words, right? That people enjoy or are having fun using something or maybe a little less ambitious that they're not as scared, that they feel empowered. Like there's, there's some really interesting kind of behavioral things that can come with that ease of use. Um, but it's mostly, I think, confidence building that a tool that's hard to use usually means it's easy to make a mistake with it, right? Or it, it, it makes you feel like you're working for it, not that it's working for you. And so that's often how I try to make sure that the guiding light that I'm following. That's, that's fabulous. I mean, this is, this, this really does, you, you both have really answered that, those questions. What can you do with these data? You can do so much to understand people, to provide better service, to make it more equitable, just everything. It makes it easier to do those what if scenarios. And the, but the barrier had been the software has been too hard. And I think it's, we finally got to a point where that barrier is, is no longer there that you can, you can do everything like uh, explain why are we changing this route and show the public this is why we're doing this and this is why it's better. I, I think it's, it's fantastic. GIS also helps you tell a really strong, compelling story and communicate more effectively with your customers. And, and that's really, I think, where transit agencies ultimately need to do a better job. I mean, they really need to find a way to effectively communicate with their customers and in a two-way dialogue. And, and so that, you know, when, and again, when I look at agencies that are what I consider to be the most effective, like I said, I mean, they are really, really focused on how do we take that feedback from our customers? How do we take the feedback from our own performance and how do we use that to continuously make our service better and better and more, you know, really meet our customers' needs? And, and that's the signpost in my mind of an effective transit agency that's that's successful. And, and that all depends on, on data and information and communication. Yeah, that's one piece maybe that uh, from the, the data communication piece. Yeah, not just uh, being able to communicate to stakeholders, um, but I think one key piece, so often we'll see, I'll see, uh, and I've experienced this myself as an intern, that transit planners and city planners don't talk to each other enough or even at all, which is wild, right? We have transportation land use folks or transportation transit and then transportation planners not talking to each other, which is even more wild. Um, they clearly have a lot they can help each other with. And I'm sure each group would love to work with each other more. Um, so it goes back to making it easy. One of the biggest things they'd want to do or want to do is share their data. And um, it's amazing what we'll be able to do to ensure that we're bringing in relevant data. Each each side of the, the, uh, the public equation, right, uh, is able to bring in data. Uh, my dream, my, my goal would be that the engineering department or the city uh, works department can communicate road closures and construction projects ahead of time. Um, I think we've all probably had an experience, not necessarily on a bus, but maybe on a bus where wondering, it looks like the driver's finding out that this road's under construction at the same time we are. Don't these people talk to each other? Um, <laughs> that's endemic, I would say, throughout uh, society and, and a lot of different places, but it's certainly a solvable problem when it comes to transit, and it goes back to being super effective and building the public's confidence in transit's uh, ability to, do, to deliver a higher level of service. Right, and, and Tyler, I think you, you raise a, a, an outstanding point. One of the messages that I make is that in most cities, you have literally 
different agencies, disconnected agencies. You have a highway department that's responsible for the roads. You have the transit agency that may be responsible for the buses. And in some cases, you even have a separate agency that's responsible for the metro. And, and you know, no one is coordinating that. There's not, and, and so one of the trends that I have seen is that really, again, some of the smarter cities are beginning to define a new mobility coordinator within the city. And the job of that mobility coordinator is how do I literally make sense and how do I coordinate these different agencies so I have a much more integrated strategy for solving the city's mobility issues rather than having these three, four, five different agencies that really aren't talking, they're not sharing data. And as you know, as Tyler, a small example, you know, but that happens all the time. It's even worse when, you know, literally there's not communication uh, between those agencies. And I think that's what, again, we see as what this potentially opens up is how do, how do we begin to create that better dialogue between those agencies and, and so that you can have a more effective sort of integrated and collaborative strategy to, to, to really solve our mobility problems. Because let's face it, I mean, it, it, it's not going to get less and less congested in our cities. And that, that's true worldwide. So we have to come up with better ways to, to address these issues. And I think it's ultimately it's better communication, better use of technology that's, that's really going to help make us more effective and, and be able to meet these challenges. And, and I think that's, that's in my mind, that's the central smart city challenge is how do we solve our mobility problems that are becoming worse and worse and more and more congested? And how do we make our cities more livable, more sustainable? And ultimately, again, that's, that's going to require data, information, and better thinking to, to solve those, those issues. Terry and Tyler, thank you so much for your time. This was, we could talk for hours. We don't have hours. Um, I really appreciate your time. I think you've, our listeners will really start to think about, hey, why aren't we using technology? And let's think about how we're using technology and data. So this has been fabulous uh, for, for me, and I've learned a ton. Thank you so much. Good, good. Thanks for listening to this week's Transit Unplugged News and Views. And a special thanks to our guests, Tyler Dvorak and Terry Bills, for their really fascinating discussion about data and what transit agencies can do and should do with data to make everything better for everybody. Now, next week on Transit Unplugged In-Depth, we have a really interesting interview with Josh Baker of Dash Transit in Alexandria, Virginia. Now, Josh started out as a bus operator in college, and he's gone on to launch new transit systems. And in Alexandria, he's going to talk about how they've relaunched the schedules, the routes, everything for really what you could say is a reimagined transit system for Dash. So I hope you tune in next week. And as always, ride safe and ride happy.